Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Andy Makes a Friend. Uh, and this week, let me fix my camera. Uh, there we go. Uh, this week, we're going to take a look at a book I, I received in the mail. I pre-ordered it a bit ago. Uh, Kids on Brooms. Uh, Kids on Brooms, I'll read from the back cover, is a collaborative role-playing game about taking on the life of a witch or wizard at a magical school you all attend. A place full of mystery, danger, and thrilling adventure. From dealing with strict professors to facing down mythical beasts, uh, players will get the opportunity to ride brooms, brew potions, and cast powerful magic as they uncover the incredible secrets uh, their school and its inhabitants hold. Built using the Any Award-winning Kids on Bikes framework, it is a rules-light, narrative-first storytelling game perfect for new players and veteran gaming uh, gaming veterans alike. Part of my floppy hat. I have a backup, which is head as well. This will be fine for now. It's much, much more comfortable without my headphones on, which I usually have to wear when I put this on for Beyond the Wall. Because I am playing a witch. So obviously, uh, this game takes inspiration from a certain very popular um, book and movie series by a, a woman who shall not be named because uh, she's less popular now because she keeps saying terrible things. Um, but you create your own magical school in this and you can play adventures inspired by but not beholden to those ideas. So just make it as gay as you can and everybody... No, everybody's... Yeah, just do it to whatever you can. <laughs> to, to poke JK in the face. Um, it's not a very big book. Um, uh, $25 for this, plus you get the PDF. Uh, PDF is here. Comes with... There's a character sheet, a class schedule, it marks... Um, uh, let's see what else. I've never played Kids on Bikes, but I, um, Kids on Bikes is, um, uh, like Stranger Things, uh, E.T., uh, the game. It's Kids on, it's the Kids on Bikes genre, the game. I think in that you can, there's like an NPC, like 11, who everyone can control or something. That, that seemed a little, um... It was like a different mechanic. I've, I, again, I've never played Kids on Bikes. I know it by reputation. It won an any. And when I saw this, I was like, this looks rad. Um, the cover to me is very uh, kind of new Archie. Like it's that color palette of uh, Riverdale Archie to me. Uh, maybe I'm just projecting a little bit, but... Uh, yeah, it is made by Hunters Entertainment and Renegade Game Studios. Um, written by Jonathan Gilmore, Doug Lewandowski, and Spencer Stark. Art by Heather Vaughn. Uh, and I love the art. I, 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 I let me, let me, maybe add that. I think the art's great. I, I, that's just the color palette and kind of the style that was, um, that it seemed to me. I think the art's great. And I love I love when books have a single artist for that kind of consistent art feel. Um so also there there's more than one centaur in this book, and I like centaurs. And I always here. Oh, I, can, I can scroll down on my screen. This isn't gonna quite do it justice, I'd say. I love this piece of art. Just love the dragon, the lake, mermaid. I don't know. I just love it. Okay. So. Um, let me take this off. Starting to give me an itch. And then replace it with this one. Oh, no. My other pad fell. No. Okay, let's take a look. I've not had it. I've I've flipped through the book very very briefly, uh, mostly to make sure. Um, 
<laughs> you know, that it wasn't like uh, defective or anything like that. I always, I don't do that enough. Sometimes I'll get a book and be like, great, <laughs> I put it on my shelf. And then when I need it and I flip through it and, you know, there's some printing error and I'm like, I should have noticed this two years ago. Um, okay, so let's see. The book is less than 100 pages and sort of the, the digest size format, which is nice. Here is it compared to a Dungeons and Dragons monster manual, so it's a it's a good deal smaller, uh, which I like. It fits on my shelf nice. It's not terribly big. Uh, it's man, I don't want to say twenty five dollars is too much because one, I love any RPG that's under thirty dollars, but I don't know maybe an even twenty would be a little more appealing, but. What, what's bubble gum shoot cost actually? Hold on. Twenty five. Okay. I, well, bubble gum shoot's a lot thicker though. A lot less art though. Well, no, Mistborn. How much is Mistborn? No price. Awesome. I mean, look how thick a Mistborn is. It's like a Mistborn novel. I'll have to go through this one day on the stream. Okay. I've got a couple books over here that we haven't gone through yet. Uh, and any excuse to go through books I've never had a chance to look at. Okay, so let's talk about the game. Um, obviously, it's based on that the, the stuff we talked about. Um, so... Um, there's a table of contents. Page one is telling you what Kids on Brooms is. Um, piece of artwork. Setting boundaries is next. Uh, which is a great section to have at the beginning of a book. Uh, especially, I think, one where you will be playing children and teenagers. I think... Um, I think it's always important to set boundaries especially when you're venturing into new territories like gaming wise like if you if you play with the same group kind of consistently i i, is, I still think it is very important to check in uh and make sure boundaries are uh, respected and established um i always try and do that in session zeros stuff changes people become comfortable or uncomfortable with things um but when you're playing children or teenagers, I think it is extra good to make sure that stuff is set in stone. So I'm glad. I'm glad the book opens with even just a page on it. Um, and it has a bit. It, it suggests as a safety tool. Um, if. Uh, Something comes up that, that makes you uncomfortable, you just knock on the table, which is good. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, interesting. They also talk about the difference between playing a game in private and in public. If you're in public, think about what you're saying how that looks to just people who are maybe overhearing you. That's interesting. Um, okay. Next up, right off the bat, is world building. Uh, and world building is collaborative in uh, Kids on Brooms. So, um, uh, or, okay. Uh, we recommend letting the players work together to craft the magical school and its surroundings, possibly in a short session prior to the playing, or even during session one. If everyone's okay with the game master thinking on their feet. Um, so, yeah, yeah, the game master could plan... Uh, uh, the game master could, could do answer these questions on their own, and... Um, sort of build their own schmog, schmog scars. 
doesn't work. Frogwarts. Um, on their own, but I think it is fun to do it together. I always like that. Um, oh, and hello, CC and Marty in chat. I, I don't think I've said hi to you yet. Um, uh, kids on Broom should probably be set in a magical school with shadowy secrets, dangerous people, or a future put in jeopardy by a powerful magic for force. Preferably, all three. Um, it should be hidden. Uh, but, yeah, ultimately it's up to you. Maybe it's not hidden. I think that's interesting, too. Okay, so the questions. If you choose to collaboratively build the world, players should first agree on the tone they want. Whether that's serious, goofy, or somewhere in the middle. I am a fan of somewhere in the middle, always. Um... Okay. Uh, then answer the following questions to create the school, adapting the number of questions asked so that each player is answering the same number of questions about the school. I'm thinking. Um, I guess you could... I. It doesn't say Game Master, but you could include the Game Master in that number, I suppose. Um, uh, question number one. Our school is called blank. Yeah, that's a good first question. Uh, two. Our school is located blank. Uh, after answering this prompt, pause to very briefly discuss how this impacts the interactions of the school and the world outside of the school. So, you know, if you're setting it in a different time period, for instance, or, or yeah, where where in the world you're setting it, how does that how does that affect what's happening? Um the head of our school is named Blank and is best known for Blank. Uh one of our favorite pastimes is a magical combination of Blank and Blank. A notable landmark in the school is blank and this question you repeat as many times as you like we suggest having at least two notable landmarks so the next two questions can be repeated several times uh, which ensures that every player answers the same number of questions uh, and then the last one is one of the most unconventional classes we have at the school is blank repeat as many times as you like we suggest having at least two unconventional classes I don't know what an unconventional wizard class is, though. Um, chronomancy, maybe? Um, uh, after constructing the school, each player shares one piece of the school's history, either known to be true or a famous rumor. Uh, <laughs> math. <laughs> Marty in chat says, the unconventional class is math. Um... Uh, either known to be true or a famous rumor. It could be a famous person who attended the school, a major event in the magical world centered around the school, or something about the creation of the school. Uh, remember, these don't ha necessarily have to be true, but they will help set the tone of the game. Excellent. Um, then each player shares one rumor about the current goings-on at the school. It can be anything from a hidden room containing a professor's secret project, a popular student's most recent relationship, or anything in between. The GM writes the, these rumors down, keeping them in mind so they can influence the upcoming game, though there may be sources for the rumors that the players can't even imagine. Uh, also, not all rumors have any truth to them. Finally, keep in mind that as long as you're within the bounds of what the group has agreed to include in the game, there are no wrong answers. And then there is a an extended little uh, uh, example. Uh, the players are named Ama, Hannah, Jacob, and T. And uh, Ama is the GM, and they create a school called Pel Pelfinor Prep. 
in the American Midwest. So I don't know why I did that accent. It's sort of nowhere, that accent. Okay. On the roof. Hot dog. There we go. That's not good. Um... Uh, what are the, what are the, oh, I want to know what they're, <laughs> they have, <laughs> okay, uh, here are the, here are the unusual cr classes. The group agrees that one of the unusual subjects that the students at Pelfinor Prep study is a pretty mundane one, magical crops for non-magical farmers. It's a course, they agree, that helps students know the limits of how much aid they can give the farmers around Pelfinor, which the school does in exchange for being left largely alone. Ama suggests a stranger class for the second one, Corn Augury. This, she suggests, is a course that teaches students how to predict the future based on offering corn to crows and seeing what they eat. Everyone agrees. Um... Uh, apparently, the most famous graduate is Brad Pitt. Uh, and there's an ever-shifting corn maze. Yeah, this, this school sounds fun. Okay. Is Brad Pitt from Iowa? I don't even know. Okay. Pardon me. Okay. Uh, the next section is about bigotry. Uh, systems of power within your world? Question mark. <laughs> systems of power within your world. Uh, you should also discuss whether your game will feature systematic, syst sorry, systemic oppressions such as racism and sexism. Go over different forms of bigotry and decide how you would or would not like them to see them in the game. For each one, you might select one of the following. Um, and then, yeah, it's just, it's just questioning about that. I think that's good. And then uh, this would be a good time to decide whether your game features fantasy oppression, quote unquote, uh, such as racism against fae, facism, or legal restrictions on magic. Uh, these forms of oppression may seem safer to work with than real-life power dynamics, but sometimes they're even riskier. Precisely because they feel safer, they can encourage individuals to exaggerate prejudice behavior. Uh, they may also lead to misery tourists, p players who like pretending they're marginalized people to enjoy the illusion of, the illusion of challenge and adversity. On temporary low stakes basis. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, fantasy can be a fun, safe space to explore some of these concepts, but keep the safety measures in mind in case they get ex exploited, exploitative. Um, uh, and then it says to uh, see more in the player safety section, which is later in the book. Okay, character creation. Um, let's see. Pardon me. Okay. Um, so the first thing you do is you select a trope from the playbook and take the appropriate character sheet. You make trope selections for your character, grade, strengths, flaws, familiar, and first name. Introduce your character to the rest of the group. Uh, answer questions about your character's relationship with other characters in the game. And select finishing touches for your character, such as motivations, fears, school bag, wand, last name, and trope-specific questions. It's funny <laughs> that first name is step two and last name is step five. 
Um, selecting a trope. Um, to streamline the character creation process, we've created a set of tropes so you can get into character more quickly. These tropes fall into categories like reluctant oracle, eccentric, eccent, eccentric, I can talk, professor, or teacher's pet. Oh, so you can be a teacher in this game? Huh. That's fun. Uh, get a character stat dice and streamline some choices for you. Tropes can be found in the playbook, which is available on the Renegade and Hunter's Entertainment websites. Alternatively, you can find them on uh, page 82. Let's go to 82. Okay. So, aloof teacher. Uh, their best skill is flight, brains, grit, charm, brawn, fight. Their faculty. And then, I guess you pick some of this stuff. Uh, bullheaded muscle. Charismatic slacker. Harry Potter. Uh, daring athlete. Doting caretaker. Yeah, you can be teachers in this game. Okay. Firstborn caster, funny klutz, golden child, haughty descendant, haunted survivor. Is that Neville? Uh, offbeat eccentric. Uh, perfect prefect. Reliable bestie, we're on. Uh, teacher's bet, Hermione. Unlikely ally, the sparkly Edward, or sparkly Cedric. Uh, reluctant oracle, that's cool. Wacky prankster, oh boy. Hold on, my cat just got up. How you doing? You're a good girl. Uh, withdrawn bookworm. Oh, and then here's lo-fi study wizard <laughs> or witch um so you can fire emblem let's go to school or whatever the last one was called i did not play that one uh so i do not know what the most recent Fire Emblem was. Is that what it was it about? A magical or warrior school or something? The last one I played in earnest was... The the, the three at Birthright. I can't remember. I, I didn't get very far in it. I did not care for it as much as Awakening. Um, it was fine. It didn't make... It was fine. Anyway... Uh, there's no right or wrong answers. Okay. So. Take a drink, sorry. That's not my drink. This is my drink. What are you doing, Mouse? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, CC in chat says that Fire Emblem's Three Houses was about uh, being a teacher at a warrior school. Okay, yeah. That's an interesting... One of the Valkyria Chronic... No, your students in one of the Valkyria Chronicles at a military academy. I've only played Valkyria Chronicles 1. Right. Oh, and the most recent one. Four. I never finished four. I gotta. I gotta go back into that. Four was good though. Uh, it was just one again. It, it's fine. And I got the DLC. We're not going on a Valkyria Chronicles uh, tangent. Okay, the stats. Uh, the tropes you choose will detune with the. Nah. The tropes you choose will determine how you assign stat dice to your six stats. 
the higher possible value on a die, the better your character is with the stat. So it uses all of the dice. So d20, 12, 10, 8, 6, 4. Um, so, which is, I mean, that's crazy range. <laughs> Um, oh, and above here it does say, if you don't find a trope that fits your sense of character, work with your GM to create a new one. Um, and there are rules for creating a character from scratch. So much like Star Wars that we talked about recently as well, uh, the West End version, where you can either play one of the, the they're not called playbooks there. Whatever they're called in that game. <laughs> um uh templates i think um you can pick that or you can create your own but it's um there'll be finishing touches on both okay so the stats are brains i think that's self-explanatory brawn self-explanatory uh fight so it determines how good a combatant a character is with whatever weapons or fighting skills you decide they know. Also, they'll be able to learn how to use new weapons and fighting skills more easily. Uh, example, I want to clock this bully, so I'm going to swing at his jaw. Mouse, drop that, please. Thank you. Um, Big girl. Yeah. Um... Uh, flight. This stat determines how fast a character is, as well as how skilled they are at evading their problems, both literally and figuratively. Characters with a high flight stat will be fast and tough to trap both... Oh, okay. Uh, characters with a high flight stat will be fast and tough to trap both physically and verbally. Um, I want to get out of the way of the Trolls Club. So I'm going to dive. Okay, that's that's interesting. Uh, charm. I think that's self-explanatory. Uh, grit. Uh, this stat determines how hard it is to break a character emotionally or physically. Uh, those books have a lot of that. Uh, characters with a high grit will be able to keep a level head in the worst of situations and will be able to keep their cool even when pushed hard. Finally, the stat also determines how street smart a character is. Okay, interesting. Uh, example, the curmudgeonly wards teacher is rewarding my homework... It, oh, is reading my homework out loud uh, to the class to make fun of me. I want to look like it isn't bothering me at all when it really is. So, you would use grit for that. Uh, the higher the stat is, the better a character is at uh, skills involving that stat and more likely they are to succeed when using that stat. While there's no guarantee you'll roll your maximum, generally characters with, will be better able to pass checks with higher dice. Um, when creating a character, think carefully about how your d20 stat and your d4 stat balance each other out. If your character has a d20 in brains and a d4 in fight, consider what that means for your character. Have they always been a few steps ahead of anyone they might have to fight, preventing things from even coming close to violence? Or have they always, when violence was about to erupt, reasoned their way out of it, or bribed the would-be attacker by doing their homework for them? Think about how your other stats' values relate to this balance. I think that's a great piece of player advice. Um, right there think about what being good at one thing says about what you're bad at. How do you compensate? I like that. Uh, stats will be used to uh, blah blah blah. Um, okay. Character grades. Uh, for some tropes, you'll also have to pick the character's grades. Underclass is 14 and under. Upper class is 15 to 20. And faculty is 21 and over. 
Uh, groups of player characters can certainly be a mixture of all three grades. Uh, I guess faculties are grade. Uh, the GM and players... Oh, in terms of the game, it's considered a grade, duh. Uh, the GM and the players will need to establish early what draws... Blah, blah, blah. Grades might come up. Okay. Oh, and there's... Okay. And there's different stuff. At the start of character creation, the character's grades determine what strength each character gets for free. Let's look at the character sheets. Is this a grade? Strength. So you, you start with your grade strength and two more. Okay. So, for instance, underclass students automatically start with the innocence strength. When rolling stat checks, uh, underclass add plus one to their flight and charm as they're fast and likable. I guess. Uh, each underclass student should write their favorite class in the space provided on the character sheet. Uh, also come up with a name for the teacher who teaches the class to share later. that in here our character sheet also has pronouns that's good nice and easy sheet look at that okay um under upper i'm sorry upperclassmen students automatically receive the trained in dot 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 strength for casting magic using a trait of their choice when rolling stat checks, upper class student add plus one to their fight and brawn checks as they're pugnacious in their prime and in their prime. Each upper class should write their favorite uh, class provided and a teacher for that class. So hold on, what's the so what's the difference? Okay, brawn is just raw strength and how tough you are. Like, how much damage you can take. And how intimidating you are. Okay. And then finally, uh, faculty automatically receive the studied in. Uh, uh, for casting magic using a trait of their choice. When rolling stat checks, faculty add plus one to brains and grit. Even if they aren't always geniuses, though if they're teachers at the school, they probably are. They've seen enough of the world to know that what it's about and not get shaken by much in the space provided on their sheet. Each faculty member should write their favorite class to teach or, if they aren't teaching at the school, what their favorite class was when they went to school. If you have a favorite class to teach, come up with the name of your best student in that class. Or maybe you make your favorite student one of the player characters. If you aren't teaching at the school, come up with a student who you've connected with outside the classroom. And it's fine if the best student or teacher of the favorite class described in any of these is played by someone else at the table. And then the, the, the sample group have created a first year, a teacher, and a, uh, and a senior, a prefect. So they've really sort of uh, uh, turned, <laughs> turned what the book would, would have done on its head and have a totally, um, a totally mixed group. Okay. Okay. Probably skim over the next couple of things. I kind of want to get to the mechanics. 
because the next okay so the next couple of things selecting strengths and flaws Um, strengths are mechanical advantages that help your character. Flaws are not mechanical, but they'll help you develop your character's personality. Choose two strengths and two flaws. Page 90. Okay. Okay, yeah. I don't know what any of this stuff means yet. So... I won't even try and pretend. Um, um, uh, okay, this is this is why they say to uh, uh, give your character a first name or a nickname they go by. Hold off on last name in case you end up being related to one of the other characters. Okay. Um, uh, then it has options for playing a different species um, orcs, elves, dwarves, goblins uh, but then it does warn you uh, to not uh, play into stereotypes um and, or use them as stand-ins for different real-world races or ethnicities. Uh, often unintentionally or intentionally. Reinforced harmful stereotypes rather than subvert them. Uh, whatever you do, be sure that your storytelling isn't harming anyone by accidentally slipping into racial or ethnic stereotypes. Uh... Yeah, just some good tips on there. In there, it keeps going. Um, oh, and it's saying you know, feel free to have orc customs be different than human or not. You know, it's if they've been in a magical society for thousands of years, cultures have. Uh, yeah, existed peacefully, and that their cultures are indistinguishable. It says. Um, if they've coexisted long enough. Um, <clears throat> uh, playing disabled or neurodiverse characters. There's a big chunk on that. Um, Yeah, and it's just it's it's lots of good stuff. It or let it's to me it seems like good stuff in here about um, just being um, aware of what you're doing and sensitive and things expect things exist on a spectrum, not a binary. Um, yeah. Uh, and then race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality. Um, and continuing to say, be, be careful and appropriate and kind. I'm trying not to just straight read from the book, but okay. But it's sometimes that's easiest. Uh, magic, not surprisingly, is going to be. Uh, and let me just say on the, the stuff that that I think that's good that the game is is talking about that stuff in 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 these sections, um, especially in. Uh, in relief of, again, what she who will not be named 
has said recently. I think it's good to kind of include, hey, do whatever you want. Just make sure it, it doesn't hurt anyone else. Um, you know, play. Make sure your representation is fair and kind. Um, and yeah, it's just, especially in... Not that, not, that, not that those tips aren't good in any role-playing game where they can be important, but it's especially good in one that's sort of a parallel to our society. You know, these games ostensibly take place in the real world with a twist. So... There's my familiar. My cat. Oh, come on. You're okay. You're okay. Good girl. Okay. Okay, types of magic. Okay, let's see. Oh, sorry. I closed the door on the cat because she was sleeping, and now she might want to get out. You gonna be good, or you want to get out? Hold, please. There we go. Okay. Thank you, CC. And yes, soup and chat saying it doesn't cost you anything to be kind. I something I um, wholeheartedly agree with. It's not it's not easy to be, or it's not hard to be kind or nice. Just respect people. It's not that hard. Okay. Okay. Um. Magic, not surprisingly, is going to be a big part of your adventure. Uh, spell checks on page 52 will let you know everything you need to know. We're only on page 20. This, this may be more than one part looking at this book. Okay. Because we're about 45 minutes in. Okay. Uh, let's see. In Kids on Brooms, magic always fills two important roles. Always follows two important rules. Uh, reflects your personality and intent. When casting spells, you'll be drawing on the essence of what makes you who you are. Your brains, brawn, fight, flight, charm, and grit. Second, if you practice magic recklessly or maliciously, you can have dangerous consequences. Okay. Uh, something else. It's important to keep in mind with checks involving magic, failure has consequences, just like any other stat check. And if you're doing something evil with a spell, the consequences of success might be far, far worse. Uh, when using magic, the GM will choose the stat that best relates to the action you're attempting using the guide below. Interesting. Okay. Each stat corresponds to a type of magic. Types are ways that players will use the essence of who they are magically to impact the world around them. Uh, uh, da, da, da. A tough, strong player might be more likely to use fight and grit, while a smart, suave player might focus on spells that use charm and brains. Okay. Uh, fight. Fight is generally used to cast magic when you want to attack enemies, break curses, or blast through obstacles. Common spells include things like disarming an opponent, causing an a target harm, crucio, or making something explode. Ex Explodia. What's the disarming one? 
at Expelliarmus? Or is that just a generic blast? Bang, bang. Um, okay. Um... Uh, remember, accidents happen at magic school. If you're going to learn to defend yourself, you'll need to apply that knowledge practically. Trying to ward off some dangerous spells. You might get hurt. One student might accidentally hurt another, even under the guidance of a careful, responsible teacher. But anyone who runs around intentionally harming others will find themselves in serious trouble. At least with the school and likely with the Council for the Ethical Use of Magic. I think that's sort of the first reference to like a even a generic setting or rules from this book. Um, classes that teach fight magic are defense against a malicious magic, history of magic, and potions. Um, your flight stat is generally used to cast magic when you want to hide yourself, avoid being hurt. Or use your broom to navigate. Common spells include things like deflecting magic, moving in magical ways, or blending into surroundings. Uh, classes include defense against malicious magic, transfiguration, history of magic, and brooms. Okay, so yeah, this is all making sense so far. Um... Brain stat is generally used to cast magic when you want to reveal something hidden, understand something mysterious, or see into a different place in space or time. Common spells include things like finding hidden passages, astral projection, or decoding magical messages. Classes are history of magic, divination, and astronomy. Uh, let's see. Brawn. Uh, move an object or keep something protected. Okay. This one, okay. Common spells include things like levitation, magically locking a door, and binding opponents. Classes are history of magic, charms, and brooms. So I think that one would be maybe the hardest to differentiate between fight and flight flight i would say is protecting yourself brawn is protecting something else and then i think you're gonna have some leeway with fight and brawn like because i would have thought like trying to hurt someone would have been brawn but it's a fight and things like levitation i i guess that may it moving things Magically locking doors. Yeah. It... I think you're going to have wiggle room there. And it's all going to be up to DM, uh, GMs. Okay, pardon me. <clears throat> Uh, charm stat is generally used to cast magic when you want to influence someone's thinking, create an illusion, or modify an appearance in some way. Uh, common spells include disguising oneself, being allowed into somewhere you normally wouldn't, or projecting images from your mind into reality. Okay, and here's... Um, here is something... Uh, it's an interesting uh, and and probably necessary little disclaimer to put here. Remember, magically influencing an unwilling per unwilling person's emotions, except in the direst of circumstances, is likely to have two very bad consequences. First, when they realize they've been pardon me. First, when they realize they've been magically influenced, they'll likely be very upset with you. Second, this use of charm magic is against the rules of most schools.
Now, okay, here's here's gonna here's throwing another confusion thing into brawn for grit. Your grit skill stat is generally used to cast magic when you want to keep someone safe, either mentally or physically. Common spells include blocking your mind from being peered into, dispelling magic that's already been cast, or healing someone who's been hurt. Yeah, I think you're going to have... Uh, I don't think it's a bad thing. But I, I, I personally would have a hard time remembering... Okay, what's the difference between fight, brawn, and grit? Okay, grit's healing and protecting other people. Brawn's protecting things and moving stuff with your mind and fight is attack like fight attacking people i get it just, it just the way the description was earlier in the book it just sounded to me like that would be brawn i'm sure it would be something you get used to and it's something that you just have to have a conversation with your gm about hey i want to cast i want to cast this spell i think i should be able to use fight because my fight is better and me as a GM, I'd probably be like, yeah, just do it. <laughs> like, what? Like, yeah, that's what you want to do. Like, that's fine. Oh, no, I lost my page. Nah. Donuts. Okay, here we go. Okay. Um. Okay. Next up is wands. Let's see. Okay. Um, when you create your wand, you get the you pick the wood and the core, and the wood adds plus one to um, certain magic checks for skill. Uh, for for each kind of wood will give you a bonus to one type of magic. When you're casting them in the form of a plus one to magic checks. Uh, and uh, the core does the same thing. So if you wanted to, let's say you wanted to increase your grit by plus two, you might pick a maple uh, wand with a core of lion's mane. Uh, and then it says if you don't want to use wands, talk to your GM about it. But you should have something that that channels your magic. Whew. And then there's a section on brooms. Um, and then the section on brooms, um, each broom does something while you're using it. So, and it, it tells you how you got it. It, it. it asks you to make sure you know how you got it and stuff like that. Okay. Next up, familiars. Hold on, let me resituate myself. Um, everyone at magic school has the option to have an animal companion because they're animals and somewhat disruptive to learning most are not allowed to accompany their caster to classes dorm rooms are well equipped to house these familiars without much noise or mess uh, while a familiar can be any animal, keep two things in mind. First, the familiar is reflection of some core aspect of your personality. You have a special bond with this animal. It chose you as much as you chose it. Um, 
Uh, does the animal reflect a part of your personality you've completely embraced, one that you like about yourself? Or does it reflect a part of you that you haven't come to terms with, perhaps the one that embarrasses or scares you? Oh, pardon me. Um, and then it has to be small enough that you can have it with you. So com common familiars include birds, especially owls or ravens, cats, small dogs, frogs or toads, small rodents and sneaks. Um, each caster has a bond with their familiar that allows them limited one-way psychic communication. Your familiar is able to carry simple tasks out for you, uh, which the GM decides narratively rather than with roles. So you just use logic. Putting a goldfish familiar in a pond to get it to swim to the other side succeeds. Smashing a door in with a goldfish doesn't succeed. It, it, uh, CC in chat says, for a rules light system, this is fairly in-depth character creation. It is. It's, but I, th I think it's a lot of getting you to ask questions about your character because it is rules light and therefore, uh, I don't want to say that rules light always equals storytelling heavy because I think that is a, an unhelpful um, simplification that a lot of people use. The, the idea that somehow rules can get in the way of role playing. They're two totally different things. But I do think this is certainly building a very collaborative story focused role playing game. So it wants you to think about your characters and and how they how they react to other characters in the world around them, and you're building a world. It's it's much like um, Bubble Gum Shoe, in that regard. Um. Uh. It, I yes, I think what Marty is Marty is saying in chat is exactly it. I think uh, Marty says, I think in part because you're creating the school, the world around it, your character, the relationships. Uh, all at once so it, it seems creation heavy so it can be rules light exactly i think it's exactly that and basically what i was saying he says we're, we're all saying this we're all saying it together we're all saying it, we're all in this together um i think we're almost at a character creation now okay so that's it for familiars pretty much Um, yes, uh, your characters are ready to share. Go around and do important details. Trope, grade, how many years you've been here. Uh, uh, and then this is where you start to think about how you're all related or you know each other and such. Oh, and that, and that it's suggesting this is when you you should start talking as your character. Like, we know each other from early childhood, not our characters know each other from. Um, which some people do and some people don't. I don't think... I, I get why they're suggesting you do it. If you never talk in care, If you always are like, my character does this and they say this instead of me like just talking in the first person. Um, let's see. Okay. Having broadly established how you know and don't know each other, each person will answer questions about the other characters. You'll do this one at a time, passing the list of questions around the table and collaborating to make the established relationship more complex and to hint at information about who you don't know. Uh, this process will make the story of the game richer. Whew. Okay. Uh, depending on the length of time you have for character creation, 
there are three different questionnaires to answer. Okay, so there's a quick question. Okay, so quick start questions. Let's see. Let me get back to here because there's a chart we can look at. What page is that? Okay, so roll a d20 and answer the corresponding question. So if we roll, let's pick up a d20 and roll it. Ooh, crap, we got a nine. So how did this character stand up for you in your time of need? Okay, so you answer that question. Um, And then there is also a negative chart. Um, okay. Um, and then, so this is for characters you do know, and then there's characters you don't know. Uh, same, uh, a different chart. <clears throat> uh, and... So this is recommended for demos and quick one-shots. And you just do this. To the person on your left. That's all you do. Okay. Uh, and that, that says it takes about two minutes per player. Uh, One-sided questions. Uh, five minutes per player. Let's see. Um, uh, and then you answer questions about each other person for one-sided questions. Uh, we recommend this approach if you want to jump into the game, especially if you're running a one-shot. Uh, you answer one question about each other character. Oh, interesting. Okay. If you feel mostly positive about them, roll a d20, answer the appropriate question on the character you know positive list. If the question doesn't fit the relationship with the character, re-roll it or just pick one. If you feel more negative about them, do the same thing, blah, blah, blah. Cross out that question. Pass the questions to, the pers to that person and have them answer a question from the opposite list. So negative, if you answered a question about them from the positive, and then you cross out that question. That's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, roll a d20 and answer the appropriate question from the character you don't know. That is for characters you don't know. They do the same if you don't know them well. Okay. And finally, they're not, so one-sided question, it says it takes about five minutes per player. The full setup takes about eight minutes per player. So, man, I, unless you have a huge group, it really doesn't take that much difference to do the full or quick, uh, uh, semi-quick one. It says quick, quick start took two minutes per player. So I definitely think for... Um, 
for a con game yeah just do quick start like there's no point in doing that okay Okay, in the long version of the setup, each player will answer two questions about each character they know and one question about characters they don't. Um... Roll a d20 and answer the appropriate question from the character you know positive. And then negative. Okay. I almost like the other one better where you're handing the thing and they they're doing the opposite but this way this way you're knowing the good and the bad about someone so th so it still works it's interesting it's just hmm. i'd want to see how that works in execution to see which version i preferred they recommend this one so where you just answer two questions one negative one positive for people you know and then one for people you don't Oh, and no one can repeat questions because you're crossing them out and passing the sheet around. Okay. Okay, finishing touches. Um, I don't think... It's full name, motivation, fears, uh, school bag, trope-specific questions. So, yeah, I, I, I think these are all kind of sort of self-explanatory if anybody wants me to go into a little detail on them but you know you pick your full name what your motivation is what scares you obviously kids and adults are scared of different things what your school bag is like and then there are trope specific questions so i think tropes were above this yeah so why do you love studying by yourself because oh, i'm the best Everybody else is loud. And how have your recent attempts to spend time with others backfired? I don't think I'm weird. Okay. And then there is a class schedule. Let me get my... There we go. Class schedule. Two pages. Ah, uh, one's printer friendly. Okay. Man, you gotta make your class schedule. Oh boy. Okay, so let's see. If you're playing multiple sessions, you choose three classes to have in your schedule for this semester. And when you apply that learning during your adventures, you'll work toward good marks in those classes. When you put enough time into studying, you'll be able to add a magical proficiency strength to your character. It's important to remember that wizards are always learning. So if you're not playing a character who is a student, these might be subjects you're getting pointers from another professor in, or you're studying independently. Okay. Okay. Sorry, checking something. Okay. Uh, let's see. In between each session, you'll have the chance to take marks in a magical class you're studying to become better at casting magic. 
because your time in the classroom will often happen off screen or be abstracted outside of play unless there is something very important to the plot happening during the lesson these remarks will represent what you have learned over the course of your time at school Um, uh, for, okay, so let's see. At the end of the session, you may take up to two marks in classes that you and the GM agree you have used knowledge for. Okay. When you fill up... your class with two... first tier with two tier marks... Choose a type of magic the class teaches that you're not already trained in and take the new strength trained in blank type of magic. Plus one. Whenever you cast the... Okay. Okay, so when you get... Okay. Get my mouse is on here. Okay, so the first time you take one... So when you get to here, you get a new strength, which is trained in magic, trained in grits, let's say, uh, and you get plus one, and then... It's harder to keep leveling up, but you get the idea. Okay, so when you get to here, you get plus three, and when you get to here, you get plus five. And then that's as as good as you can get. Might as well just graduate. Okay. Uh, suggested classes available to, choo to take. Choose three. Defense Against Malicious Magic, which specializes in fight, flight, and grit. History of Magic, which everything. Potions, fight, charm, grit. Divination, Brains and Grit, Astronomy, Brains and Grit, Numerology, Brains and Charm, Charms, Brawn Charm and Brains, Brooms, Summoning, Transfiguration, and then the Unconventional Classes. Uh, brooms is Flight and Brawn, Summoning is Brains, Charm and Grit, and Transfiguration is Charm and Flight. Okay. Gonna skip over some of the stuff that was uh, creating your own character. Um, changes to your character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just marks and relationships and stuff like that. Okay, playing the game. Here we go. While you're playing, anytime you do something that runs the risk of failure, the GM will set a numerical difficulty for the action. You will then roll the appropriate stat die and check the value of that die against the value of the difficulty. If you roll the maximum number value of the die, and that isn't enough to succeed at the check, you have a, quote, lucky break, meaning you re-roll the die and add the maximum value that you rolled the first time to the new roll. Okay, so exploding dice. Uh, you can have multiple lucky breaks on a single check, but as soon as your total is at or above the difficulty, you have to stop. So if the difficulty is six and you roll your D8 stat and get an eight, you don't explode. It's because it, you got an eight. I don't know how long my face has been off screen, but whatever. <laughs> um, but if you're rolling a D4, because one of your stats will be a D4, and you roll a 4, and then another 4, you beat the 6, that's all you need. Um, and they have narrative implications uh, narrating the results. OK. 
Okay. And then the highest you can roll is a 20 without bonuses, obviously, because the best, um, the best die you have. Ah, crap. Sorry. Just make sure my phone's okay. so old. Okay. Okay, here we go. Choosing a stat for the check. Um, I'm sure that's fine. Okay. So, difficulty, 20 or greater. A task at which only the most incredible could even possibly succeed. But if they succeed, it will be one of the most impressive things a person has ever done. Uh, this is nearly a guaranteed failure. Yeah, you're going to have to get real lucky. Okay. Um, so then, th yeah, there's just a little difficulty scale going from 1 to 20. So the interesting thing is... Let's say you're playing... Hold on, let's... Okay, let's play, say you're playing the Withdrawn Bookworm. And you have to make a Brawn check. And the Brawn check is 10. It's going to be hard, obviously, with a D4. But the lower your dice, the more likely you are to have it explode. So that's interesting. Whereas a D20 is swingy. You know, a D12 is swingy. Obviously, you're, you're, you're better off... So, big difference between a 12 and a, a 20. Interesting. Interesting. And it seems like there are bonuses, but they're not, not a lot of them. One or two. Man, if you were making a player roll for a one or two, why? Stop. Just stop. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we're into we're into more of the rules now, but I wanted to I mostly just wanted to talk about character creation and the very, very basics of the rules. The rules are starting to get a little more in depth, so it's gonna be a lot more of me just kinda uh pausing, reading, and reading aloud. So I think I think that's actually where I'm going to stop for this episode. But I'm gonna come back to this. We're gonna talk more about the actual mechanics of it, but so that was character creation and the very basic of the rules where you roll a die, you have to meet a skill number or a, a beat a check. There's a couple pluses you can get. But otherwise, you're if for a num lower number, you're hoping for it to explode. And bigger numbers, uh, you're going to want to have to use your brains if you're a bookworm. Okay. I hope that all made sense. Uh, if, if anybody has any questions... Put them in Twitch chat, or if you're on YouTube, feel free to leave me a question on YouTube. Um, uh, I will go over more of this game soon, and I know that Andy makes a friend. Uh, there's another couple games I want to talk about coming up. Um, what else do I want to talk about? I want to talk about Wolves of God from Kevin Crawford. That's pretty new. Uh, Miss Mistborn, which I mentioned earlier, uh, Witchburner, Mothership, uh, Mini D6, the Witcher role-playing game. There's a lot of stuff I want to talk about coming up. Uh, so I'm going to try and keep doing these probably about once a month, the way the, the schedule's working out. Um, but please like and subscribe. Uh, interact with your screen in some way. Um, leave a comment if you enjoyed this video, if you found it helpful. If you didn't find it helpful, leave a comment and I'll uh, read it. 
and try and be better in the future. Uh, this week is Task Force Unlikely. Uh, yeah, they are in Mithril Hall still. I can't wait to say Grim. I flipped that a couple times. They are in Mithril Hall, uh, leaving Tarbex. Uh, they are with Tarbex family currently. Um, and on Sunday, we will continue to go beyond the wall. And everyone remember, you're just a g dead giant baby. Um, be kind to each other. Please wear your mask. Wash your hands. Don't be racist. I love all of you. Where's my hat? My good one's on the floor.